Good evening, everyone. Thank you all so much for coming. Just wanted to give a little introduction before we start this amazing panel. So, my name is Georgia Lamary Tomzak. I'm the public programs manager at the Zoo Care Gallery. We are the contemporary art gallery on campus. We're located on the first floor of the Stoller Center for the Arts, and um, we've been here since 1975. Uh, this panel was organized in connection to our current exhibition titled Revisiting 5 Plus 1 that we'll talk a little bit more about in a little bit. Um, I wanted to introduce Audrey Fernandez, who's one of our amazing current Stony Brook students, um, who is going to talk a little bit about her work with Black World. For those of you who don't know, Black World is a student-run media organization at Stony Brook. They are dedicated to serving campus by providing a voice for black and Latino communities since 1974. So we've got a lot of groups that have been around for a while. Um, and Audrey Fernandez is a lead writer of Black World and a Stony Brook senior majoring in biology, and minoring in Africana studies, and has some very exciting things to share with you all. You may have to turn it on. All right. How's everyone? Good. All right. Um, just wanted to shout out Dr. Clark if she's here. I don't know if you were here. I saw you earlier. Yes, thank you, because you fu um, funded us. You're one of the departments that funded us alongside journalism and the Africana Studies Department, and as well as Dean Rick. Um, so Black World, um, the last time we printed was 2013 and now it's 2023. Ten years later, we were able to relaunch it. Um, we're very excited about it. Um, so just to start off, I just have a few minutes, but um, we started off with a proposal letter to Dr. Clark, um, Dean Rick, the Africana Studies Department and the Journalism Department, explaining how there was a need for students of color to have a media that represented them, not just an article where you know we're mentioned or where we just feature in. Um, and that's how Black World came along. It was a four to five month process. We started off in October, at the beginning of October, and we were able to finally send it out to print last Wednesday, actually. And these were some of the flyers that we, if you saw them around campus, you possibly did. Um, the deadline for students to submit was last month, January 8th, and then through there, we, it was editing and layout processes. Um, shout out to um, Josh, too, from the press. They were a big help. Um, towards the process, and also to promote, Anthony's not here, he's the president, but we're also having a show called Ejo, February 17th, showcasing um, students um, of color and everything that they do on campus when it comes to singing and dancing, so if you could come out, that'd be great. And February 25th, we're launching our release party uh, for the publication, it'll be great for you all to come out, it's been 10 years, and um, there's so many people, over 30 contributions towards this newspaper, and we, everyone that has seen it so far has loved it, and we can't wait for it to be out. Thank you so much, Audrey, and congrats to um, Black World and all the students who have done incredible work on that. Uh, so now I'm going to turn it over to Elise Armani. Uh, she is an art history PhD candidate here and one of the amazing co-curators of our current exhibition, Revisiting 5 Plus 1. I'll just briefly say thank you again for everyone who's here. Um, this panel is something I've been dreaming of for uh, several months, and I'm really excited to see it all come to fruition tonight. Um, I just want to briefly introduce our show for those of you who weren't able to join us for the tour before this, and to note that the gallery will be open um, after the panel wraps up this evening. Um, so in 1969, um, from October 16th to November 8th, there was a classroom in the Humanities Building that was turned into an art gallery. And in that small classroom out here on Long Island, on this campus that was only eight years old, um, six, of, six artists who would become the most, um, among the most uh, important black artists in the United States brought their work together. They were young, they were in their 20s. Nobody really knew who they were, but they showed their work to students here on campus. And um, about a year and a half ago, myself and my two co-curators, Amy Kong and Gabriella Shapula, had the opportunity to look into this history and see what we could dig up. Um, and so 
we realized early on we wanted to put on an exhibition that would bring this some form of the show back to current students. Um, and we kind of divided up research, uh, who would focus on what aspect of the show, what we could find, what we could dig into. And my camp was to dig into the campus history and understand Stony Brook in 1969. And um, I'm kind of a local history nut, so I thought this would be interesting in general, but when I realized how much was happening at Stony Brook in the late 60s, I realized that this deserved a show, a dissertation in and of itself. Um, but alas, we didn't have time for that. But I wanted to bring um, our alumni from that moment um, to be in direct conversation with students to talk about all of the really incredible, important activism that um, was happening here at Stony Brook, led by students and supported by faculty to develop um, a program in Black Studies, which became our Africana Studies Department, to develop um, Black Students United, which became our current Black Student Union, to occupy O'Neill College and create a space for Black students on campus, to create publications, um, like the Black Voices insert in the Statesman um, that uh, sort of set the precedent for publications like Black World to come to fruition. And I, I wanted to create the opportunity for our current students to understand um, the folks who really paved the way for our current resources that we take for granted here on campus. So um, I won't take more of your time because there are far more interesting people here tonight to hear from. But um, please do come see the show if you haven't had a chance to already. Um, and with that, I'll go ahead and introduce our moderators. So um, this evening we have, um, in conversation with our wonderful, wonderful panelists, um, Dr. Abana Asare, who is an associate professor of Africana Studies and History here at Stony Brook University. Her writing and research span questions of human rights, citizenship, and transformative justice in Africa and the African diaspora. Her work can be found in The Radical Teacher, the International Journal of Crime, Justice, and Social Democracy, the Los Angeles Review of Books, among other places. In 2018 to 2019, she was scholar in residence at the New York Public Library's Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. Her book, Truth Without Re Re <clears throat> Reconciliation, A Human Rights History of Ghana, was chosen as a choice outstanding academic title, 2018, by the American Library Association. And her upcoming book, When Will the Joy Come? Black Women in the Ivory Tower, um, being published with University of Massachusetts Press this year in 2023, is currently available for pre-order. And Dr. Asare is joined by two wonderful undergraduates we have here, um, Julio Taku, who is a senior majoring in mass communications with a minor in Africana Studies, who works for, um, writes for the campus publications, The Stony Brook Press and Black World, and Audrey Fernandez, who um, we just heard for, from, who is also um, a minor in Africana Studies and a major in biology, um, who is also part of the efforts to relaunch the Black World publication. So thank you, all three of you, so much for being with us to moderate this panel. So to start off with the panelists, um, just give her a hand of applause, because she's awesome, Deborah Britton Riley. Um, she came to Stony Brook in 1973 as a first generation student from Harlem. After her bachelor's of science at Stony Brook, she received a master's in management and public policy analysis in 1981 and had a long career as an administrator focused on maternal child health and educational leadership. She recently returned to the Brook to coordinate the new student and transition programs after a 12 year retirement. Prior to this, she was a director of the Academic Enrichment Program for 18 years. She has served as a mentor for several boards of directors, including the Planned Parenthood, the Suffolk County Department of Health, and the Suffolk County Executive African American Advisory Board. During her brief retirement, um, Ms. Britton Riley developed a business where she consults and develops grand proposals, travels through Europe, and wrote a, mem a memoir about growing up in the 1960s in Harlem to be published later this year. Ms. Britton Riley has two handsome sons who she notes are not married <laughs> and have been married for 44 years um, with her husband. She is a lifelong learner, um, a devotee of social justice, social justice issue, and advising students on issues that contribute to the overall development. Just a hand of applause to her again. Uh, 
And another one of the alumni visiting us tonight is Mitchell Cohen. He grew up in a Jewish family in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, where he still lives today. He enrolled at Stony Brook in 1965 and was an active statesman contributor, a member of Students for a Democratic Society, a founder of SDS, Offshoot, Red, ba Red Balloon Collective, and a rabble-rousing activist, which led him to be banned from campus not once, not twice, <laughs> but three times, because that's a charm. Since his time at Stony Brook, Cohen has been a lifelong activist, a poet, and the author of several books, including The Fight Against Monsanto's Roundup, The Politics of Pesticides, published in 2022. I actually have read about Monsanto, so this is very much something I'll discuss with you. As a student, Cohen organized peers in support of unionization efforts and against the war in Vietnam, student military recruitment, and war-related university research. In the decades since his departure, Cohen has worked with efforts that include the No Spray Coalition campaign aiming to protect people from pesticides, a campaign to ban cow's, cow's milk containing bovine growth hormone from public schools, and efforts to free Af American Indian movement activists Leonard Peltier and Black Panther Mumia Abu Jamal from their lifelong, lifelong prison sentence. In 2001, Cohen ran for mayor of New York as a New York City as a Green Party candidate. He's a long-term contributor for WBAI, the listener-sponsored radio station in New York City. And per his last count, he's been arrested more than 50 times. That's 25 times two, five times 10, 50, as in the amount of states we have, Puerto Rico withstanding. <laughs> Who wrote that? <laughs> The trick is not to get arrested, the trick is to do it and get away with it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, next, sorry about that. Next up, we have um, Dr. Linda Hazel Humes. She enrolled at Stony Brook in 1974, an Africana Studies major during her four years on campus. She served as the Vice President of the Black Student Union back in the day, so hand, hand an applause to you for that. Um, <laughs> the Director of the Black Gold Dance Troupe and co-founder of the Black Theater Club and worked at the Black Early Childhood Center. In 1977, she was, a she was a graduation speaker for the Department of Africana Studies. After graduation, she interned at WNEW -E radio station and went on to be an entertain entertainment reporter for the PM Magazine. In 1989, Hume started her career as a storyteller and fol folklorist performing and conducting workshops na nationally and internationally. In 1983, she founded, I'm really gonna butcher this, sorry. Yafa. Yafa <laughs> Cultures Arts, and organized focus on the social cult cultural awareness and the arts, which was recognized and with citation for excellence in arts and education from the New York City Council. As an actor, Dr. Humes has been in a variety of commercials and films, including the most recently, most recent episode of Law and Order SVU. I haven't watched that, sorry. But I want to watch it now, now that I read that. <laughs> Dr. Humes is currently an adjunct assistant professor in the Africana Studies Department at John Jay College in New York City. Her area of research is, is African-American storytelling and culturally responsive education. Um, hands applause. And our next panelist is Dwight Wesley Loins. He attended Stony Brook University from 1969 to 1973, serving as the Minister of Information for Black Students United in his first years as an organization. Before it was Black Student Union, it was Black Students United, to those who don't know. He was also a counselor for AIM and a student representative on the committee that developed the first Black Studies curriculum. Thank you. In, con in contributions for the statesman, he served as the voice of BSU, explaining the group's efforts during contentious moments like the delivery of demands for the Black Studies program and the O'Neill College takeover for a Black Students Lounge. If you think Martin Luther had something to say, you should ask him about what, ha what went down on those, during those contentious times. After graduation, Mr. Loins attended law school at Hofstra University. Since the 1970s, he's directed political and legislative activities in Washington, D.C. and across the Northeast on behalf of and in conjunction with labor and civic organizations. From 1991 to 2001, he was the president of the National Organization of Legal Services Workers. 
He directed Political Action Committee's campaign funding and grassroots in support of candidates for public office throughout the Northeast and has acted as the chief executive and administrative officer of labor organizations. In his career, Loins has, has represented thousands of union members on substantive issues including workers' comp, health care, and affordable housing. Though semi-retired, Mr. Loins is still dedicated to the practice of law. A round of applause. It's nice hearing your accomplishments read back to you sometimes, isn't it? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm getting on in age, so I didn't quite hear everything you said. I said you it. You want it, to repeat all that again? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Great. Okay, what happens now? All right, so. Please. Yeah. Yeah. So, we got a little book for you. Yeah, no, this, is a, this one's a long one, but I'm sure it's Can a great one. Let's just begin. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just begin, Mr. Town. Mm -hmm. All right, so next up we have Dr. Leslie Owens, came to Stony Brook University in 1978, following his term as the director of the Center for Afro-American and Afri African Studies at the University of Michigan, Are following his graduate. Beg your pardon? I'm not quite sure how to I won't have anything to say. I mean, this <laughs> Okay. <laughs> we'll read what's on the slide then, because that's the truncated version. Okay. A man who needs little to no introduction to those who know him. He is Professor Emeritus Leslie Owens, Stony Brook University Department of Africana Studies, 1978 to 2015. Boom. PhD, University of California, Riverside. Boom. Former director of the Center for Afro-American and African Studies at the University of Michigan, boom, and author <laughs> of This City's Species of Property, 1977. The rest of his illustrious career will allow him the opportunity to yeah, speak about. All of them. <laughs> so, Thank you, everybody, for those wonderful introductions. We want to jump right into it. How we wanted to begin was to allow each speaker a few minutes to kind of offer up their own introduction, tell us about how you got to Stony Brook, what it has meant to you, kind of situate us within the intersection of your story and this institution. So thank you. Who would like to go first? I know some people have slides prepared, but yes, let's just go that way. Go down. Thank you. Good evening. I came to Stony Brook, as my bio indicates, in 1973. My beloved Harlem had been ravaged by drugs. I grew up in a community that was very engaging, very rewarding, loved its children. Um, there's a section in my book when I talk about um, the, the drug dealers when we were younger, they wouldn't allow us past a certain point of, of the street. They would say, kids, take a dollar, take a dime, whatever. Go up the street, buy some ice cream. Well, within two to three years, that, that sentiment changed, and they were encouraging our participation. And as I said, Harlem was ravaged at that time. I grew up on 116th Street between 7th and Lenox Avenue, which, is, which housed uh, the, the mosque that Malcolm X built and that was burnt and bombed. Um, so I guess Stony Brook was a, a place to, to be comforted. Mm -hmm. I came out here and I saw these wonderful trees and this vast greenness. Um, there was a, an uh, academic, what was it, AIM, the a Advancement on Individual Merit Program that welcomed me. Um, I was a high school dropout, yet I have two degrees. I was a high school dropout at that time. I then went and got, received my, my undergraduate, my, excuse me, my diploma, high school diploma. Um, and at that time, it was right after the Civil Rights Movement. They were taking us like, just come, just come, sign here. You're now an undergraduate student. Mm -hmm. I've never taken an SAT in my life. The only reason why I know what an SAT looks like is that I worked for the college board. Um, so it was a very inviting community at first because it saved me from the <coughs> ravages of Harlem and the drug situation there. Um, it supported 
things that I thought of, that I had aspired to, um, despite the fact that um, it, was a, it was a kind of precarious environment in that um, there weren't too many black or Spanish students here. There was no Latin students, and they were all Spanish students then. Um, so there were a small group of us, and we stuck together. And in that, it was very comforting. And as I had mentioned earlier, we received quite a bit of camaraderie and guidance from the Advancement on Individual Merit Program. So it was a safe place for me. Um, despite some of the, the uh, inclinations toward developing as a student and recognizing who I was at that particular time as a black woman because I was starting to learn that I was being introduced by, to that concept by quite a few classes that I was participating in and by the, the, the young women and men that I was interacting with. Um, as I had stated previously, it was right after the Civil Rights Movement. Um, we wanted to identify who we were, to talk about who we were, to understand who we were. Um, Stony Brook provided that opportunity at first. Um, we met some challenges, um, but we were able to work through those challenges with the assistance of our departments, with the assistance of the small group of black and faculty, black faculty staff that was here, and with the support of one another. Um, it was, a, it was a difficult campus to, to, to master at first. There were, no build, there were no names on the buildings. We would say, go to the building over there to get your financial aid, or go to, the, uh, seriously, there were no names on the building. We had to walk around, and there were big mud holes. It wasn't a very inviting campus, but as I said, we had the opportunity to take advantage of education that was afforded us, um, and there were people here who were willing to guide us, and we wanted to learn. We wanted to learn. And I'm sure that there were a number of other people that this was a refuge in terms of the city that, that we were fleeing from. Um, so initially, that's what started my venture here. Um, it has been engaging for me. There, has been very, there have been some difficult times, and I'm sure I will attest to those through the questions that will be formulated. Um, but it has been engaging. Um, I was able to master um, my grades despite the fact that I was a high school dropout. My first year I was a 3.75 dean student because I was dedicated um, and I wanted to stay here and I knew what the requirements were to stay here. Despite the fact that I wanted to go to medical school and there was a doctor here that said, well, you're science, uh, you shouldn't do that, you should do something else. And, I didn't know any difference, so I went as a first generation student, I said, okay, well with a 3.75 with that kind of drive, I could have gone to medical school. But I have no, I have no qualms about it. God led me in the direction that he wanted me to go. Um, and I'm sure, have I answered your questions? I stay, I stay now, I, I retired after, t I retired um, after an 18 year career here. Um, and then I came back in June of this year. Prior to my retirement, I had been participating on a number of uh, committees, and um, I just enjoyed working with students here. I started a student organization in 1978 that's still quite functional now. Um, I continue to mentor those students, and I decided to come back and participate more. Um, those 12 years afforded me some wonderful opportunities, um, but I really enjoy Stony Brook. Um, I like the, the, the new people that I've met here. Um, the young folks have taught me everything I need to know about operating my iPhone and the computer, <laughs> so I feel quite technologically savvy. Um, it's been, an, it's been quite an inspiration. It really, really has. Aside from some of the issues that have, I've encountered as a black woman on this campus. Um, but and overall, to answer your general questions, um, that's how I felt about being a member of, of this community. Thanks. Uh, who's doing the slides? <laughs> Can we, can we start with the Steve Biko slide? Oh, yeah. Right, so th this is Steve Biko, the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. And Steve Biko, for those who don't know, was a South African revolutionary, founder of the Black Consciousness Movement inside South Africa. He was 
murdered using U.S. cattle prods that the South African apartheid government tortured him with in his cell. I think it was in 1976. I'm not sure of the year. But I always like to remember where we come from. So the next um, slide was the original one that you had. Not that one. <laughs> no, the, the, uh, that was the brochure for this. For this event, yeah. That one. Okay, so if you notice, this was supposedly uh, black students meeting with the administration, even though Bentley Glass was not an administrator, he's a biologist. And uh, Tom Drysdale over there was the polity president. Standing in the back against the wall was a fellow named David Woods. Dave Woods was an administrator. He was the head of the University Relations and Media. Okay, now, several years later, we found out something we had suspected. He was a nice liberal guy. He was always very friendly. He was informing on students to the New York State Police. We actually got him drunk. We knew it beforehand, but we got him drunk we had a tape recorder in Fred Friedman's backpack from Red Balloon, and he admitted doing that, that he was informing on people, on student activists, sending them our social security numbers, our addresses, our confidential information. That was this administration. I don't think, it, I don't know who's the administrator now, so I won't, <laughs> but administrations work like that, you know, unless they're confronted with uh, people's power. So now, what happened with Dave Woods, right? So what happened with the information he gave? Several years later, like why would they want to know? A friend of ours, Paul Watson, who was a Black Panther student on campus, is the founder of one of the Black Panther chapters here, was taken by the, the police, came to his door in the table quad in the room with the help of Stony Brook security, which they now call police. We used to call them mooses. And, uh, and, they, uh, and they never used to be armed as long as the radicals and Black Student United worked together, which we always did to prevent the army or the police. Now they're armed. And they got to his room, they had the keys, they pulled him out of his room, a student. Now we're talking about 20 year, 21 years old, 22 years old. Pulled him out, dragged him down to the 6th Precinct in Quorum, and hung him up by his wrists from the pipes on the top of the precinct in the basement of uh, the Quorum Precinct. And they beat him with sticks every day for two days till he was bloody and beating, uh, beaten, and then I forget how it was that we got him out or that we even learned about it, but that was the result of the information that David Woods passed on to the state police. This, and anyone who just thinks that that's just nothing, you know, it has serious consequences for a lot of people. And they did that with all the radicals and all the black students and white students, the white radicals and black radicals, they did that too. Why? So now we could ask why? Because we were organizing. What was the Black Panther Party doing with the white students at that time? We were organizing a free breakfast for children program in Riverhead. We went uh, somewhere. There's, well, I don't know. This is, uh, these are, <laughs> these are all uh, different scenes. Okay. Also, in the lower right-hand corner here, I don't know if people know, and this will connect, is a prof former professor here named Jonah Raskin. Jonah Raskin was a minister of culture for a time in the Black Panther Party, even though he was a white guy. We were all working together. He was, was in an anti-war demo. He just wrote to me today because I wanted to get the information right. He's out in California now. And uh, he was taken with the information that they helped get 
by the New York State Police, uh, New York City Police, NYPD, and they had a thing called the Red Squad. The head of the Red Squad's name was Finnegan. They pulled him out of, I mean, he was doing some things, for sure, in the middle of this anti-war demonstration. Just to give you an idea of the flavor, there were anti-war demonstrations every day. We were outraged at what this US government was doing to the people of Vietnam. Uh, 13, uh, Three million people killed in Vietnam of Vietnamese people. You know, it boggles the mind to think that that's what this government was doing. And we also had a person at, at Stony Brook who was a resident writer named Ron Kovic. He wrote uh, the book Born on the Fourth of July and there were movies about that he was involved in. And he helped educate lots of people about what happened in his trip to Vietnam, his tour. And he was horrified at what he himself had taken part in. So Jonah was had the was beaten up till he almost died by the police, by Finnegan. It's in his autobiography called uh, Inside the Whale. Inside the Whale? Outside the Whale? Out of the Whale. <laughs> Out of the Whale. And I was going to read it, but I'm like, uh, his text to me. But, and he was a professor here at Stony Brook. His class eventually had over 1,200 students in it. Imagine that, 1,200 students at a time when there were, what, eight or 900, I mean, eight or 9,000 on the campus. Jonah had every radical thinker in this country and in other countries come to that class and talk to the people in the class and teach that class and guaranteed everybody an A or a B. So you got an A if you showed up, if you got a B if you didn't show up. And, because we were challenging the whole grading system, right? We, why are we being graded on our poetry or, or on this or on that? So we had everybody from Eldridge Cleaver came from the Black Panther. All the Black Panthers came to his class, including uh, Bill Ayers, including Bernadine Dorn, including the people who later became the Weather Underground, and lots and lots of other people who are activists came through their class and taught English, taught people what to read, showed us what we're, you know, what we should be doing, how there's no such thing as a, an apolitical piece of art. An art that claims to be apolitical is in itself political in its own way. So that's some of the things we were doing. And, uh, I would, these, these are scenes, <laughs> that one in the upper right hand corner is me in the middle. <laughs> next to me is Spencer Black, and next to, and on the left is Arthur Mitchell. And uh, Arthur Mitchell was a main organizer. We were the three plus a few others who weren't with us then, especially a few women who weren't there in this picture were organizers for the great boycott in support of Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta and the organizing of California grape workers. And it was Stony Brook students that we organized. Into, so every day we would go out and fight at different supermarkets to support the grape workers. And in questions, maybe I'll tell you what we did if you want to know. But the, the point of that was that Art uh, Mitch, his name was Mitch also, Art Mitchell, when eventually after this very successful great boycott, we had a letter from Cesar Chavez saying we were the only county in the country that was clean of scab grapes, of non-union grapes. How do we do that? Why didn't anybody else? Well, we took liberties <laughs> at stores. <laughs> and uh, we made sure that, that those stores did not sell scab grapes. Uh, but then Mitch was, uh, he had to, there were the riots or rebellion in Central Islip right out here, right? And Mitch was accused, maybe he was, maybe he wasn't, I don't know, of running weapons to the people involved in the riots, in the rebellion, who were being shot at by police. And how did he do that? There were, 
nuns that we were friends with, nuns who ran the weapons to the people in the community under their habits, right? So the one issue carried over. We met the nuns through the great boycott, right? And then one issue carried, and then Mitch went underground, and I haven't heard from him or seen him since. But he was a hero, an unsung hero at Stony Brook, and his name should be on the building. You know, Arthur Mitchell, you know, should be across the buildings here, for better or worse. And there are a lot more. I have a whole list of stories like that. This is just like the first three out of ten thousand. So I hope we get a chance to talk about that. But to know that when black and white students work together, not only just because of identity only, but because of we have a same radical vision of a different world that we live in. You know, a social justice world, one that's also environmental uh, and ecological, one that's also no war and against wars. We can begin to make some changes at least, but we have to organize together. And without organization, we're nowhere. Thanks. Good evening. Good evening. Wow, that, that's something to follow. I, I, I'm glad they let you out for tonight. <laughs> uh, so like my uh, dear friend Deborah, I'm a Harlem girl too. So I, uh, I was raised uh, in a brownstone on 120th Street between 7th and Lenox, which is now Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Boulevard and Malcolm X. My experience was I went to parochial school for 10 years and uh, I was the only African-American girl in the school. The parallel to that was that my parents were uh, at some point Garveyites. And so even though during my formative education, I learned, I don't think I learned anything, I don't even think I learned about Dr. Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks. But at home, I always learned the, count, uh, the counter or the concealed story. I was told, yeah, you put that down for the test, but this is what really happened. So uh, I had a concealed story about uh, Fidel Castro. I remember clearly, and I don't know if you remember, sis, when uh, Castro came to Harlem and was uh, at the Teresa Hotel, right? Um, <clears throat> I had a concealed story about Christopher Columbus. Uh, so everything that I learned about multicultural contributions and achievements and specifically African American history, I learned at home uh, with uh, a family that was very multicultural. I'm, I'm sure that many of you might have heard of the play uh, Plantados and Collard Greens, that was my experience with aunts from uh, Guayomo and Ponce and uh, you know, a uh, godfather from Honduras and a godmother from Barbados and you know, so you know, it was uh, very much the Harlem um, that Langston Hughes talked about, you know, the melting pot and the, and the, the, the rhythms and the rhyme. So I came to Stony Brook, uh, really uh, advised by my uh, godfather, um, first generation uh, college, and I thought I really wanted to go into communication, but at that time, there was not a communication department, and I really liked theater, I loved the arts, I just came out of an executive internship program at Lincoln Center, but then I really wanted to learn more about uh, African American history. But then I also really had this compassion to uh, be part of the solution. My mother was a social worker. So how do you put all that together? Oh, maybe I'll major in psychology. At that time, I'm sure now too, Stony Brook had one of the best psychology departments, right? That went out the window, everybody, because once I heard that you had to dissect a mouse or a rat or a frog or anything like that, I changed to social science. So I was a social science and an Africana studies major with a minor in theater. What Stony Brook did for me 
was it allowed me to play. As Deborah stated, you know, we had a camaraderie amongst us, uh, and sometimes I was just pulled, you know, just pulled. Oh, no, you know, come, come to the black student organization. You need to run for this and uh, do this, or come here, come there. Well, do I really have to, you know? But thank goodness for my peers that kind of pulled me. One of the things that we noticed was that in the theater department, there were no roles for us at that time, you know? And so my sister, Denise Jennings, Denise, we would wave at everyone. Yes, uh, Denise and I and Linda Hughes at that time, you know, uh, we started uh, the first black theater club here at Stony Brook. And we, and we did a lot of wonderful plays where other students that were interested in theater could do theater where we could have juicy roles and also tell a story. My experience at Stony Brook allowed me to do everything that I'm doing now. So we were able to book acts and gr book groups and just create, just create. What do you want to do? And we had a great relationship, to your point, you know, working uh, across the color line, ethnic color line, re uh, religion, and the president at the time of the student union, you know, worked very, very closely with us. And at that time, if you all can just imagine, you know, at 18, 19 years old, bringing people to campus like the last poets, Sonia Sanchez, uh, uh, you know, Creative Source, uh, Melba Moore, uh, you know, National Black Theater. We had a school bus filled with actors from National Black Theater. And Denise, I don't know if you remember this, there were more actors and performers that came than actual students that you know, to watch. But the richness, you know, and, and we were just able to experiment. We were able to experiment. Uh, and we were able to really learn a lot about ourselves. It was a coming of age time for me, but also, the Africana Studies Department, and also there were so many of my friends that were in AIM, and God, you know, you know, thank God for AIM, and thank God for those professors in the Black Studies Department. And you know, now you know you hear about all these stats about how do you keep students of color in. In, in, in school, how do you keep, get them to graduate? Well, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We know how to do it. The, the professors were always under attack for being with us, mentoring us, talking to us, uh, being, uh, being the, you know, in, in charge of the clubs because they wanted to, to let us understand what was happening, not just academically, but wh what, was under, what was going on in the world and, and how we could see ourselves in it. So uh, I have to give so much to those professors, you know, Dr. Blackman, Dr. Kennedy, I'm, I'm sure there's just so many, I don't want to, uh, uh, you know, um, miss names. They gave many people opportunities to get f um, free rides to law school, you know, because of their contacts and identifying students that they felt could really do it, right? Uh, I remember uh, sitting down in one of the, uh, the professor's offices and saying, you know, uh, you as a young woman, you must always make sure you can take care of yourself. This is in the late 70s, you know, so this is feminism <laughs> coming from a African American male um, professor, you know, just to let me know, you get your own, take care of yourself. So with all of this said, I was able to come out of that experience and um, I did not have the language then, but I have the language now. So the language that I have now is that I am a Renaissance woman and did not, uh, did not go with, 
oh, you can't be an artist and an administrator. You can't be an educator and work with the community. No, I was able now to do all the things that Stony Brook set me up to do. You know, uh, I founded a not-for-profit arts and education organization that books many artists. We have a roster of over 100 teaching artists and performers that go into the schools uh, in all five boroughs and beyond. Um, teaching the concealed story, teaching social justice, teaching character education, teaching restorative justice through the arts. I also have a performing career. I still do you know, storytelling, but I also use storytelling for corporations, community-based organizations, helping community-based uh, organizations, helping uh, human um, services organizations to really uh, deal with their clients in certain ways with certain stories. Uh, my work um, is around culturally responsive education and how important it is for all of us to know about the achievements and the contributions that we all make and how uh, we all can be part of the solution. All of this was a basis here at Stony Brook. So what I'd like to say to those of you who are students, you know, uh, the students, take advantage of everything you think you might be interested in now and let Stony Brook pay for it. Make your, your mistakes here. <laughs> you know, the, the young lady, you have your, your magazine, do it. If you're interested in radio, if you're interested in theater, if you're interested in booking, whatever it is, you, whatever it is, let this be your experimental playground. You know, because you have access to do it. So it's one thing, yes, to you know go to classes. And I was teasing um, my dear friend earlier, and I said, you know what? We were really wildcats. We did some crazy stuff when we were at Stony Brook, but we did our work. <laughs> we did our work, you know. So that that's what it's about, you know. Do the work, but 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 experience and grab it because all of those things that you learn, you can take with you when you leave out of here and and be true to who you are. Don't let anyone define you and tell you what you can or cannot do because then you will find down the road that if you stick to your heart and your purpose, even if you don't have the language, you'll wind up being just who you are, your unique self that is doing your work through ikigai. Ikigai is a Japanese expression for living on purpose and living in your purpose. And so for the students here, you know, just, just stay true to who you are. And that's, that's my story. Am I next? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> first of all, I don't have any slides, okay? <laughs> that's number one. And two, I'm gonna be as brief as the previous three, three speakers, okay? <laughs> and, and, and if that's uh, if that's okay with everybody, yes. no, that, I, I'm actually going to try to be uh, briefer th than the previous speakers. I understand there's supposed to be a, a question and answer and comment period, mm -hmm. which I'm looking forward to because you know I typically learn a lot in that process. But it, it's interesting because some of the um, my time at Stony Brook overlapped with a few of the, the previous speakers, but I was unaware of a lot of the activities that people were involved in. So I'm, I'm learning a lot just by participating in this. So I wanted to thank uh, the um, organizers and also the, the particularly the, uh, I don't know how to refer to them, your, your staff people. I believe they were undergraduate students who did a lot of work to get me here. I was uh, resistant, not really. It, it was just difficult to catch up to me, and we didn't actually put, uh, confirm my participation until about a week ago. Um, and, uh, but I'm, I'm appreciative to all the effort that they put in. Uh, you know, as, uh, and, and I come, uh, I need to correct the part of the bio. Um, I came in as a transfer student. So I actually completed my coursework in 70. 
Um, although I had a few incompletes. You remember what incompletes were, right? Oh, I'm still here. <laughs> so, so I had, I had to, com uh, to, to complete some work in order to, to finally uh, qualify for my degree. But, um, and then I worked briefly um, at Stony Brook uh, as, a, as an AIM counselor, which we won't go into great detail here at this point. But uh, so I, um, but, but one, one of the other things I wanted, wanted to um, correct is that um, I, um, I was actually, I guess, um, how can I put it? I, I was, even though the Black Studies program was not in existence at that point. Um, and when we came to campus, actually I also come out of uh, the Harlem community. And Harlem was in the 69, 60, in the mid 60s, um, was, was jumping. There was a lot of things going on. I, I was a uh, community activist at that point. I got involved with, uh, with anti-poverty programs and one of the, um, the, the theories, at least, behind anti-poverty was that it was to empower, organize and empower the community. So I, I inculcated that, I believe, uh, at an early age. I, I was a part-time student uh, at, at the City University of New York, but I was also an organizer, uh, a community organizer for uh, How You Act. And I got assigned to work for uh, on a number of different campaigns, including the Columbia University uh, issues. And I was involved in organizing, helping to organize community people around issues um, that, uh, that were fermenting at, at Columbia University, including the, at least at that point in time, our concern about what we con con perceived to be the uh, university's, university's expansion into Central Harlem. They, they actually, if you go back and look at you know, uh, their, their footprint at this point, it's fairly extensive. <laughs> so, but, but we did actually stop something that, that the community was quite concerned about, and that was the um, construction of a, of a gym uh, in the Morningside Park area that people thought would um, take away some of the, um, you know, resources of the community. So that, I, I got involved and, and uh, it, it, that was an interesting time. We, we you know we had or, we um, we had um, um, organizing drives. We supported the, the students that were active at that point. Uh, this, I think, you know, at, at, at some point the university sort of exploded, and that there were a lot of arrests and and um, and buildings that were uh, um, you know occupied and whatever. But so. It, we, we did work in support of, of those activities. Um, I, at, at that point in time, as I suggested, Harlem was very, there was a lot going on. I had an opportunity to actually um, spend time um, with, I, I don't know if the people know the name, Yuri Koshiyami. Mm -hmm. Yuri Koshiyami had a, an apartment on the Upper West Side in Manhattan, and as young students, uh, you know, we had we were a fairly small group, a fairly small group. But I got invited to participate in discussions. There were there were meetings that went on, um, periodic meetings, and uh, we had a chance. Everybody who was active in the civil rights and the sort of the radical movements at that point came through. Uh, uh, Yuri's uh, apartment, and we sort of thought of it as, you know, uh, like the old uh, salons in Europe where people came together around kitchen tables and talked about political activities and whatever. So we spent, you know, we, everybody who was everybody, anybody, came through Yuri's um, um, apartment. Uh, I remember meeting, I, I'm pretty sure that's the first time I met Carmichael before he, ch he changed his name, and uh, H. Rap Brown, I don't know if people re still remember that name. And um, d just about everybody came through there, and we had an opportunity to sit down and talk to people and talk about the future and what, you know, wh what we thought about the movement and where things would, would go from there. The Truth Coffee Shop, people familiar with the 
truth coffee shop. All right, it was on 125th Street. It was a, a gathering point where people, I didn't drink much coffee at that point, so I probably uh, wasn't a, a good customer. But, you know, people came together in groups to talk about the struggle. We, uh, at, at that point in time, not only was uh, Harlem a central, central to the struggle in this country, <clears throat> but people from around the world came in. We, we met, the first time I met with a group of black people from Australia, not the original Australians, but black people who, who were descendants of slaves in, in Australia. And they, um, that, that was, that was mind opening for me. And, you know, but they came, they, they knew what was going on, heard what was going on in the States. They wanted to have a dialogue. We sat down with, with them and, and talked about, you know, how we could be of mutual support. Uh, students from Brazil. Now, obviously, uh, Brazil uh, probably had more black slaves um, uh, than the United States. But we knew hardly nothing about it or, or what their experiences were. So it was great sitting down with, with uh, a number of those students and talking about, um, somebody keeps trying to call me, sorry, and, and talking about uh, their experiences. Uh, so the Truth Coffee Shop was an institution that, that, uh, that was a great gathering point. So when I, um, you know, and, and of course one of the things, of, ma of many things we were concerned about was, you know, black student enrollment. We, um, as, as part of my anti-poverty work, we worked with an organization that actually uh, uh, set up a foundation I convinced them that I, was, I should get a scholarship, so <laughs> I was able to actually come to Stony Brook as a, uh, as a, a scholarship um, uh, recipient. And uh, so I saw Stony Brook as a sort of a natural transition, not so much, uh, it, it was sort of a continuation of what we had been involved in. When I got here, there was the, the black student organizations were in flux. Uh, but there was no black studies program. There was hardly anything else. So um, we knew what the agenda was. <laughs> the agenda had been set, frankly, from you know our brothers and sisters around the country, and so we set about making demands for you know increased um, student uh, minority student enrollment. Uh, if people go back and look at this, the um, the the um, the publications in the 70s, uh, early 70s, you may see, uh, frankly, a handful of black students in, in those, um, uh, you know, in those pictures. There were there were a few uh, Latino, Spanish students at that point, and, and frankly, a few Asians. And I am I haven't been to the campus in a while, but my sense is that there's been a big change, a big change for for the better. Um, and so we set about working on that. We set about talking about the need for black studies. We somehow, uh, I'm not sure how we did it, we somehow convinced the Stony Brook Foundation that, that some of us should go to Africa. So we, we, a contingent went to East Africa, another contingent went to West Africa. I was with the group that went to East Africa. We met with student uh, leaders there. We met with ac academic people. And at that point, Tanzania was considered sort of a progressive, you know, state. And so um, it, it, we met with political leaders. And it was also an interesting place for, um, I'll, I'll call them black expatriates mm -hmm. who came through Tanzania, including, um, what's his name, Williams, who was an activist in, in North Carolina mm -hmm. who organized um, self-defense. Uh, um, work and uh, took on the Klan and whatever. He was, I don't know the exact details, but at one point he was run out of the country. He went to, he went to China at a point and when we met him he was coming back from China making his way back to the United States, but we spent time with him and other people in, in, in Tanzania talking about their experiences 
uh, and whatever. So uh, I, I, I thank Stony Brook for that part of my education. <laughs> I'm, not sh I'm not sure if they thought about it, but we thought about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, so it happened. And um, the, the other group went to West Africa, to Ghana, and, and other parts uh, of, of West Africa. And um, I know that at least one of our professors, and I, I'm sorry, I don't remember his name, was a West African. And so he, he facilitated that, uh, the introduction of that group in, into, into Ghana. So that, um, you know, we, we you know, we didn't have a lot of resources, but in terms of the Black Studies program, I know we invited a lot of people in uh, to uh, that. that uh, fortunately, I guess my experiences in, in Harlem, I was able to meet a lot of people in, in uh, the black struggle and whatever. So we invited a number of them out. John Henry Clark came and he was, uh, you know, people should, read up, up on him. I, I, re recently, I was in West Harlem, and, and uh, he's passed away, obviously, but there, there's a building with his name on it, and, and it's, uh, I didn't get a chance to go in, but when I go back, I'll, I'll, I'll try to follow through on that. But we brought people in like that who helped us sort of formulate what we thought should, uh, you know, the Black Studies program should look like. So I, I wasn't, fortunate enough to be involved in the substantive work that hap happened later on, but I believe that, you know, a lot of what we did helped set the stage for, uh, for that. Um, I, um, you know, as I said, I'm looking forward to, to a conversation here, but I, I'm concerned, you know, about, I think all of us are about what's happening with, with um, black studies, the, the Potential, potential evisceration of, of the programs. Uh, there are, I know in some states, in fact, even some cutbacks uh, in, uh, in programs. I'm hoping that here at Stony Brook, the, pro the program is healthy and moving forward. But it's, you know, it, it's not just, you know, the existence of the program. When we, when we thought about it, you know, obviously it came out of struggle. My concern at this point is that, uh, you know, there's pushback in terms of trying to eliminate some of the more progressive uh, aspects of, of, um, of the black experience. I mean, not wanting, you know, there's, you know, the Santos in Florida doesn't want to include um, the black um, um, movement around, you know, George Floyd. Mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter. He wants to. In fact, he's got he's gotten some support from the college boards on that. I mean, that that's some serious stuff. And you know, I I would hate to see Black Studies programs become less connected to their roots. Mm -hmm. And that's something we, that we have to fight against. And so I'm. Um, but but a couple of things are, are encouraging. One is. You know, a after the George Floyd murder, you know, I, walking through uh, Manhattan and, wa and looking at the demonstrations that, not just in Manhattan, but all over the country and the world. I mean, that, that was something that, to be honest, was surprised me. But it indicated that, you know, the struggles in, in this country have, are, are, so significant to what happens around the world. And we need to always think about, you know, uh, how to connect and um, with, with those struggles and, and how to continue to promote. I mean, if, if black studies doesn't, doesn't include the militant as, aspect of our experience and, and the struggles that, that black people went through, um, and also, of course, um, our relationship with, with progressive organizations in this country, if that doesn't, if that's, you know, uh, taken out of the program, uh, that, that's something that, that we need to be very much concerned about. But as I said, I think the, the, the fact that the demographics in the country have also, is also changing, changing gives us some hope. However, I'm reminded of that um, quote from uh, Jurassic Park, 
you might <laughs> think that I, uh, you may be wondering what I'm referring to, but there's a quote in one of the uh, Jurassic Park's movie where I think it was Bloom says, he's talking to, I think, a congressional committee or whatever, and he says, um, uh, nature all, will always find a way, and he's talking about the, pres you know, the, the, uh, the prehistoric, I guess, um, creatures. And, but my, my somewhat perversion of that saying is that, you know, the reactionary people in this country will endeavor to find a way. Okay, so that, you know, we have to be very careful about that. And, and so the struggle, and, um, it's great to be here to celebrate black studies and, and et cetera, but it is, the, the struggle actually continues and in fact has to, has to be intensified from our, from our point of view. So thank you. Thank you. Well, I'll begin like this. I wore this shirt because I, this is how I feel about black studies mm. and a few other things. I still can't breathe mm. uh, right in a way. But at Stony Brook, I wasn't a student at Stony Brook, uh, although it feels like it when you teach at a place that you there. But a lot of black studies, when I came here, for example, Stony Brook Black Studies, there were no tenured people on the faculty. Hmm. This was 78, so some of, the, some of your uh, time at Stony Brook, the other panels, uh, that's a difficulty. I had come from uh, Ann Arbor, University of Michigan, and I had tenure. So one of the first things they had recruited me, in effect, was you have to have stability in a program. You have to have stability. You can't do anything if the people who are teaching in the program are all vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know what that feels like mm -hmm. as a student to be vulnerable to surprise quiz. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is taking place. So was just one of the things, African Studies programs, many of them that started in 68 from San Francisco and stuff. Um, Many of those programs, departments later, disappeared. Mm. They disappeared as soon as they were, a few years after they were set up. So it was like, okay, black studies, Africana studies, African American studies, African American and African studies is proliferating, but it's disappearing as fast as it's as being set up. Uh, many people within the university here then uh, knew that. It was just, okay, you're coming, focus on Stony Brook again. There are these slots, who's there? You know, the enrollment was way down. As it began to fall, if you don't have faculty who can sustain something, then you can't attract students. So the agreement in my case was, okay, you can hire these people. One of the first people that was hired was Mary Baraka, in essence, one of the founders of the Black Arts Movement, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which some people, studying literature, is compared to sometimes the Harlem Renaissance. Of course, he has some personal problems, but the point is, well, you want something substantial, already here at Stony Brook for at least a year before I came, was Fred Dubay. Who knew Biko in South Africa, who was a major spokesman, he was a cognitive psychologist. He was uh, the major spokesman for the African National Congress on the East Coast. He had been in jail on Robben Island with Nelson Mandela. So he knew, well, firsthand, we were being tortured, we were being abused. Uh, just firsthand, it was very different but he had no security either and stuff. So the first thing in my mind, it had been from before was uh, decent faculty who publish, 
who can attract students, you know, if they are authentic people. Because part of the problem is, as you know, just as uh, students, that professors can be very inauthentic. So authentic people meaning, well, you find out over time if they are or not. So early black studies had to go through just a lot of that. Uh, difficulties with itself, but difficulty with the university. My coming, they promise much. So when uh, Cohen was here, John Toll was the president. So John Toll uh, was part of the interview that I was, very wealthy man, but he was gone when I came. So, but he had been authentic in trying to bring up black studies uh, with Lewis Kozer, who is a, a, one of the leading sociologists in the country at that time, was on the hiring committee. Uh, they tried to be authentic. They promised things on paper. Mm. I came, the people down below that level don't necessarily listen to the people above. Mm. He was gone, so you find that often promises are made okay, we're going to set up in a black studies, whatever. Um, but the people down below, they could be at the dean's level or whatever. They say, well, um, I don't, we can't deliver on that. I said, but you wrote it on paper. So we had to face those. I think these are problems that were around for uh, a lot of black studies, particularly the notion that not everybody in administration is on board with setting up your program or trying to diversify or even get into certain subject areas. Not everybody's on board with that. And they can be the ones who block, block action all along. The first year that I was here, I said, oh, for the interview, Black Studies was in the psychology building. I said, psychology is behavioral science or behavioral modification <laughs> at Stony Brook. They had about three rooms. I said, that's not adequate. They promised a, other space, that we would have other space by the time we got here. We got here, that was not the case. They went back on the promise. We can't be here. We can't function in this, you know, closet, you know, that you said there would be a difference. Uh, it didn't happen, so basically, in terms of our action, we had to demonstrate. We had to just, some people would say, go to the streets. <laughs> but go to the campus, just you promise. We're not asking, I'm not asking for anything that you didn't promise. But in order to have legitimacy, you have to have the offices for the faculty that you're going to hire. You have to have spaces. Don't promise it and don't deliver. So. The offices that African Studies has now, we got it way back then by simply saying, look, uh, that's not what you promised. So students were very cooperative, a very diverse group of students. Much was happening at that time. You know, it soon will be uh, disuniting against apartheid. It soon would be uniting against this nuclear plant that Stony Brook is still within the 10 mile radius of that you have here. Uh, of course, they say that they'll never put it into operation, but Stony Brook is still close to it. Um, you still have to deal with the aquifer and the trouble with your water out here, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which I stopped drinking years ago. When coming to the campus, I just said, well, um, I'll drink. I won't drink <laughs> water and parts of, but nonetheless, we got, uh, we had to demonstrate. And the first, within the first year I was at Stony Brook, and I was here a long time, I had to resign. That's the only way that they would listen. I said, you promised on paper, the students supported it, had to resign. If you don't deliver, look. There are other things to, to do. So they gave us the rooms that African Studies has now eventually. First, we were on another floor. It was inadequate. It's where the anthropology department is now. 
if any of you are in anthropology, we shared it with them, but that was not very cooperative. It doesn't mean that because certain people at the university want uh, black studies to begin, as I said, that other people at the university on the faculty or in other positions, even students, want it to take place. So they can do things, whether professors or others, to block. So we had to demonstrate again. And meaning this, the first two courses that I offered were uh, slavery, which was big because Alex Haley had just run through 1977 the largest miniseries on roots. So Americans were sensitized to slavery. 130 million people watched. Um, that was my feel and the civil rights movement. The first course that I offered, civil rights and slavery, one of the courses alone was larger than the enrollment of the black studies program that had been here. This one course alone, because students were that interested in it. I said, wait a minute. Well, what had gone on before? Mm -hmm. But a lot of students were interested in the civil rights movement. The civil rights movement course over several decades was the longest running civil rights course in the United States. That interest kept, I find people, the slavery course, the first time I taught it here, it attracted 150 students. They said, well, there's no space for it. Okay, we'll put you in a lab. So I taught it in a lab. I said, well, you're supposed to have rooms. The Javits Center, whatever. You know it's going through another renovation. Things are going up. So just some of the space that Stony Brook, physical space, has been transformed over the years. It's major transformation now uh, that's taken place, which is obviously good in some ways, but in some ways, a very terrific campus that developed over time, you could see it. Um, but hiring other people, security for Dubai, just, there were no women in black studies. I said, well, you, you would need, you'd have to have a diverse kind of program. I mean, what we call feminism now, I say, well, Look, women have always been a part of the experience. I have six sisters. Don't tell me that women. Anyway, but some of it is the kind of perception, the funding now. There was no funding for black studies. We're going to hire, we're going to set up a program. Well, what's the funding? What do you mean the funding? I said, what's the funding? You can't put on any program, you're saying, you want to hire people. You have to have funding in a program for it. So it's very difficult. We wound up, fast forward, having over the next 20 years, the largest FTE faculty, you know, teaching full time in relationship to students ultimately, you know, in what was called LSNA, but it still didn't increase the funding. You know, I said, well, Look, something has to, to give. We tried, I tried um, to expand it to reach out to other programs, but I think I'm talking about a lot of different black studies uh, programs. We early were attacked. Some of it may have been because of the things we were offering. It may, some of it was clearly, the first year I was here, I had a run in with the provost. But Stony Brook had different levels of provosts that have developed over the time. And it was simply, these were the promises made. The response from this particular person was, I wasn't in the room at the time. I said, well, that's not sufficient. So uh, I had written a five page, single page spaced letter saying, these are things we wanted. Back then, I wanted microcomputers. That's what they were microcomputers before personal computers were gone. I knew about them. I knew we had to have a library. 
because I went to the Stony Brook Library, I said, wait, one of the biggest ways that Black Studies makes progress is you have a library that has adequate resources. And if you don't, then one of the ways to get it is you have an in-house library, which African Studies has now, but it, it didn't then, we had to take down a wall between the two small classrooms or seminar rooms that were there. But also it helps if the people in Black Studies and others simply sit down and order books for the library. You can do an enormous good for your area of discipline if you, on a regular basis, because the librarians are often very helpful. If you just fill out the form, faculty can fill out the form, say, could you please get this book? And do it on a regular basis to build up the strength of your area. You know, and then you'll find, oh, somebody's responding to it, and they now have these books. It accumulates over the years. If that's what, if faculty members are doing it on a regular basis and thinking, even students thinking, well, what can I do? I said, that's one thing to really be helpful in the long range mm -hmm. uh, that it's there. We tried to, um, years later, um, I said the attack began. Um, we invited Alex Haley here in 1983, I think. Um, I had some brief affiliation with him through the slavery thing. Um, he attracted the largest crowd in Stoller that Stony Brook had had. People from the community came in. If you want people from the community, I said, well, everybody knew Alex Haley then. Uh, and we're outside because they couldn't get in to hear him. So he agreed to do a seminar uh, in African Studies, the facility now, in the classroom that's up there. Everybody wanted to get in. We said, well, obviously they can't be. So one what things that were suggested simply to do for Black Studies was, look, there are staff people who work at the university. They want to hear Alex Haley too in a small setting. So there had to be some staff people, some faculty, some students in a seminar with Alex Haley and from the community. You know, it helped because then a lot of staff people at Stony Brook, uh, whether they're sweeping floors or working in the, the many offices, they're the people that you come in contact with. Although the number was limited, they appreciated it. And it helped to get them interested in some of the things that Black Studies was doing here. So our classes, you know, began to grow so much we couldn't handle them. And we said, well, you promised teaching assistants, we didn't get them. I said, okay, maybe you don't have students who are trained in these areas, which happens. Uh, but could you get some provide some funding for it. In 83, uh, we, the problem that we had was our cognitive psychologist, Fred Dubé, came under major attack uh, within the university setting and outside the university setting uh, for his activities largely as uh, he was anti-apartheid as most of, many of the students on the campus were, but for uh, a teaching uh, topic that he had suggested. Not an assignment, but an optional topic that related to uh, Zionism in this case. He had a very diverse and mixed class, but the point is the unit was attacked. So much so to show you some of the pressures of, that were, we were under was the governor of the state got involved. Cuomo, not the last Cuomo. <laughs> the first Cuomo got in state, got involved. The legislature got involved and threatened, first African studies, we were used to threaten, threatened the university. Got so, their threat was simply, we'll hold up the budget of Stony Brook unless you eliminate African studies. I said, you're kidding. Were that important? you know, and stuff. I said, I don't, wow, there's, wh what have we done? 
Well, the only thing, basic thing we had done is we had hired a Mary Baraka. <laughs> we had suddenly, our classes were very large because at some point the civil rights course grew to 300 people. I said, well, that doesn't, that's not supposed to happen in black studies, is it? But it's, it's civil rights, it's not just black studies, it's about civil rights uh, for it. Um, but the university was threatened, so the president at the th that time was Marburger. There was a black provost, Homer Neal, who was a high energy physicist uh, here, who was very helpful. Uh, Marburger was scared. Uh, even though he would later become the scientific advisor for George H. Bush, H. W. Bush, uh, in you know, after 2000 at least, um, but he had every right to be scared because suddenly the university was under threat from the governor and just interests. So the only thing that we can do was students were very supportive who were in the classes and outside could see whatever. Uh, we also did another thing. I wrote a letter to the Black and Puerto Rican Congress at the state capitol, who then intervened themselves. So we had to play politics. They were playing politics. We just, the Black and Puerto Rican Caucus uh, then wrote a letter from, on letterhead, which I still have, just to the university and to the uh, the president saying, look, you know, you're not going to do it. So things begin to evolve. Sure. Professor Dubé, however, continued to go through troubles for years. He's denied tenure, among other things. Um, uh, we were threatened physically uh, in the offices that are African Studies now. We had to set up a video camera, a video tape, on the floor that the hallway that, that people walk down, if you've been up there, walk down now, to record anybody who walked down because certain individuals came on the campus, threatened black students who were on our floor, threatened Jewish students and faculty, Jewish faculty member who was on the floor as well, uh, with uh, possible harm. They said the university solution initially, well, could you leave the campus early after you teach? <laughs> could you, you know, maybe that'll help. But Marburg issued his first persona non grata to the folks who later uh, set a firebomb in the village, in Greenwich Village, later that year. But uh, we kept our camera on the floor. People said, why do you have... Well, we were advised to and stuff. So I said, well, black studies must be very important. <laughs> if we're, if this is what's happening, we must have attracted some attention, but it was not good attention. You know, it was, look, we would like to teach courses that cover uh, the diaspora, which means vast area. We would like a diversity of uh, black scholars, male, female, you know, a diverse student audience, which you can have, you know, of significant rigor. We would like the ability to be able to invite some people from different places who have expertise, you know, uh, in, this, in these areas. We don't think that if this spreads throughout, uh, if the unit is attracting enough students to, in effect, fund itself, that is, one of the presidents of this university told me in a direct question, I said, what happened to the money? If this much money in pure tuition dollars that students pay, and in effect, they're voting by their, they're registering for your classes, flows through African studies, what happens to it? My response was, well, it goes to different parts of the university. I said, it wasn't generated in other parts of the university. It's generated for the students who take courses in African studies. You know, we should be, we, because it's generated here, we could 
be doing a lot of things, but we don't see any of that money. It's still an issue, I think, in certain black studies around the country. If you generate the money through tuition dollars, it's easy enough to calculate that students are taking your classes and you, you generate for the 90s, for example, over a five-year period. We generated a million dollars excess, excess. And the university, because it was having budgetary problems, still said, your unit owes, and other units still owe the uni university $21,000. We have to budget cut. I said, we generated in excess of a million dollars. Where is it? Hmm. A simple question, no answer. Because there is no real answer for, for that if physics generates three or four million dollars in excess. It doesn't go to other places in the university, I assure you. It goes to them. And it's a way that you can build your own reserves. But uh, I said some of these issues really are throughout black studies uh, even today. The attack, it could be, oh, critical race theory. I said, well, what do you mean? Sure. You don't even know what it means. Mm -hmm. All it tells me is, <laughs> it just tells me, you don't know anything about black studies, or you don't know anything about slavery. You know, I first thought the, the leading texts were, oh, Elkins, well, f I think black people were Sambo. <laughs> this is what's being taught at the leading universities. Hmm. Danny Elkins, it was a leading theory. Mm. Or even Kenneth Stamp, who I have no problem with, but in the preface says, well, black people are really, uh, they're really white people with black skins. Hmm. I said, Kenneth, um, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> that you may have a certain meaning, but in terms of Examining the sources, you know, is that what you? Yeah, right. That's who you would enslave? You'd enslave yourself if you had, like, no. Uh, but I think some of that is, look, that needs to be studied. That needs to be understood. That, that doesn't come from what is, that's one of the difficulties that we have with understanding what people are calling the black experience. Or the current Africana studies at Stony Brook has people from who, the Cameroon, Professor mm -hmm. Ethiopia, you know, it goes on from the Caribbean, from here. Like America, that's part of the, what has to be, you know, examined. It to be examined when I, I say, what are you afraid of? Uh, I say, well, I don't want to, I don't want to have people feel guilty about. I said, well, hey. okay, um, Mr. DeSantis, in 19, that century that's passed, 1994, you were, just out of high school, just leaving high school, but in high school, what did you study? You know? Because I remember not having slavery mentioned in lots of the college courses. This is U.S. history. Okay, slavery, let's go on. So. Or Africa, Western civilization, we're not going to study Africa. Just close yeah. that chapter out. I said, wait a minute. It's in the book, but we're skipping over it. Um, it occurs to me mostly, and I'll stop. Okay. You know, <laughs> okay, last good. thing is that my experience at Stony Brook, teacher, in running into a lot of professors, other professors here, who privately, they don't know much about the black experience. Some privately will admit it. You know, but as a university professor, you sometimes are supposed to an air of things. I said, well, look, 
You don't, really. Um, um, initially here, a lot of students, even things like Kwanzaa, which everybody knows about now, but I don't think they know the principles or where they came from. <laughs> or they think, I offered a course last thing here in ancient Egypt. They would, well, why do you want to, how can you offer a course in ancient Egypt? What connection does it have to? I said, well, um, for one, uh, I'm interested in ancient Egypt, have been, and um, can read hieroglyphics, can any of you? <laughs> so let's legitimize the course, but mostly it's, uh, is that part of your experience? Is that part of the black experience? I said, well, look, the originator of Kwanzaa that we take for granted, Ron Karinga, also has a PhD in Egyptian studies. Very few people know it. Yeah. I said, well, the connection in what is the black experience or whatever, you know, would be very, very useful if some more people within the university who teach in the university understood it. Okay. I'll stop. Thank you so much. So, folks, everybody take a big inhale and exhale. Whew. We have received a lot of wonderful information. It is really important, I think, to hear some of these stories and take them in. I'm aware that our time is up. In fact, we are past time. So my proposal is that we disband at this time and we can continue our conversations, our questions, especially for our students who would like to interact with our um, elders here. We can continue our conversations in small groups. Let's give everybody another round of applause for all that they've shared.